we've returned to one of our favorite driving roads ever, Pacific Coast Highway, Highway 1, south of Monterey, California. We thoroughly love this road. Now, the problem with it is people know about it. People have heard. It is an awesome, awesome drive, but you can cruise, kind of like I'm doing now, behind other traffic and have an amazing time. And we've returned for the driving experience using two cars from Haggerty Drive Share to do it. If you get the chance to drive this road, what you really want to do is drive it in something special. And we have two things that are quite special on this drive. Great cars, great roads, and all the reasons we love to drive. TV, web, and podcast. This is Everyday Driver. I am in a Factory 5 Type 65. That is essentially Factory 5's pit car version, replica of the very famous Daytona Coupe race car. And about six of them were built from 1963 to 1965. They set land speed records and they set endurance racing records. If you want one, you can pay about 20 million if you can even find one for sale. So the question is, how do you get in one? Well, there were 50 continuation cars built by Shelby American. Even these cars are about $350,000. But there's also other replicas built by various manufacturers around the world. We've specifically asked for the Haggerty built Generation 3 Factory 5 Type 65. But a really good Daytona Coupe is going to cost you somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 grand to build it yourself, or 80 if you find somebody selling one and you want to buy their pre-finished project. We also have this Porsche 356 replica. The 356 was Porsche's first production car. They made about 76,000 of them, many of which came to the U.S. But original ones are worth a fortune, two to four hundred thousand dollars. But for a tenth of that, you can get one of these vintage speedsters. They made about 3,300 of them. They are one of the well-respected replica companies that makes a 356. Both of these original cars are blindingly expensive and unavailable to the average person. You can't find these. You never see them. They don't come out of their hiding places. But replicas? That's the accessibility. That is how you get the driving experience out of both of these cars. Starting the beast. Oh. Oh. Listen to that. If this car doesn't get your attention, nothing will. This version is built off the Type 3 Factory 5 chassis, and that means it's actually a complete rethink. The way you probably want to do it is the complete kit, which is this. All you have to bring to the party is the engine and the drivetrain, the rear axle, the wheels. You're pretty much done. You can pick a myriad of options. You can do electronic fuel injection, which this has. You can do power steering, which this has. Air conditioning, which this also has. You can decide on your suspension component, pick up the pony, but they're provided to you by Factory 5. You can do variations of the live rear axle. You can go all the way up to an independent rear suspension. So how do you get in one? Haggerty Drive Share. Because they're replicas, they're less precious. You can just take them out, and you can just enjoy them. Peter Brock was the designer of this car, and he convinced Carroll Shelby that aerodynamics was the cheapest free horsepower. And so Peter Brock took the Cobra chassis and designed this body around it. When he tapered all of the surface towards the rear, he just cut a single section off. That's the tail. And I think that is the best part of this car. This car is timeless in that sense. And it does reflect the manufacturing techniques of the day, but it also reflects a lot of Italian styling, but American too. It's, it's a definite, an interesting mix of both of these cars. The interior on this car is about as simple as it gets. Now, it's not designed to be luxurious or ergonomic. Now, you shouldn't expect that when you drive this. It is essentially a lightly veiled race car that's been remade and put on the street. It's going to seem uncomfortable at first. And what you have to do is, of course, remove the steering wheel just to fit in here. But once you get it on the spindle here, you'll notice that it's decent. 
but the transmission housing intrudes into the passenger footwell, so that means your legs are kind of canted off to the side. That's how the original car was. It was sort of an engine wearing a beautiful car, and then you were last on the list. So first of all, it's a blueprint engine, it's Ford 306. It's got loop heads and a Holly Sniper electronic fuel injection. It's connected to a T5 transmission, so it looks like a top loader, but it isn't. It's actually a five-speed. You can buy pretty much whatever you want when you've got a replica. You can get this with a six-speed. You can get this with an automatic. This one only has 370 horsepower, about 350 pound-feet of torque. In case you haven't noticed, it's also quite loud. The pipes are straight pipes. They're just below the door. As a result, we've had to wear earplugs because we're in this car for so long to do this interview that we've put on earplugs to defend ourselves. <laughs> yeah, that's quick. That's, that's quite quick. And uh, unbelievably loud in the process. Somebody asked me earlier, does it have a horn? I said, does it need one? Can't you hear this? I keep scaring people out of the way with the exhaust note. Thank you. When you're this loud, people get out of the way. I mean, I could be a genuinely terrible driver with no horn and no idea what I'm doing, and people are just getting out of the way because, have you heard this thing? When you're making your own replica or you're, you know, specking one out, it seems like you want the most power ever in a car like this. I make the case or not because of the weight of the car. Whenever we talk power, we're always talking about the ratio. I'm shocked by the power to weight in this car. And even at a low level, this car is absolutely a rocket ship. The difficulty with these cars like this, though, is you have to dial them in. They don't come ready. It's not like you bought a car off the showroom before and it's perfectly dialed in. This one is dialed in well. I was a little daunted. I was unsure how this was going to drive. And the thing is, the longer I drive it, the more I'm impressed by it. It asks quite a bit of you, but in return, it gives you a fantastic driving experience. There is nothing to save you. Nothing about this car is going to intervene between you and your driving skills or lack thereof. But every turn, every little straightaway, you're just going to want to punch it. Right. They're very right. 
One of the only issues I'm having is the fact that the pedals are a little oddly spaced, so I can't heel toe. Look, I'm being that picky to find stuff that's bad with this car. This is well set up, and this drive is amazing. This drive is amazing in the car in front of me with white random bikes hanging off the back. It's still an amazing drive. I just have this. Even though it's a replica, it's genuinely special. And it's the driving experience that I think everybody should have. Everyday Driver is brought to you by Covercraft. Use the code every day for 10% off your order. There goes the Daytona. Guess what? I heard him coming. I know you're shocked. Now, just because you aren't in the Daytona Coupe doesn't mean you can't have a special driving experience on Pacific Coast Highway. You could just as easily enjoy this car. This is a Porsche 356. Okay, it's not really a Porsche 356. This is a vintage Speedster. Vintage Speedster's been making these cars since 1988, and they are 20 to 30 grand new. People that are selling them might get as much as 40. You compare that to two to $400,000 for a real one, and you can start to see the attraction of buying the replica. The reason the 356 is so beloved, besides it's just the first Porsche, was it has everything you need for a good drive and no extras at all. This doesn't even have windows. Form definitely follows function on this car. The wheelbase and the chassis were determined first by the engineering and what they wanted the car to do, of course using some Volkswagen parts, but then they enclosed it in one of the most beautiful, clean, classic shapes. Now look at the interior. You're sitting down in what everybody calls the bathtub, and that is the case. There's not really a foot well here, it's just a well. It's just a wide open space where feet go. The weirdness is you actually do have your feet to the right of the center line. In fact, the gas pedal is to the right of my right shoulder. And with the Speedster, it's the tiniest windshield. You're so exposed to the elements, it's almost like you're riding a motorcycle. Feel those floor inch pedals, brilliant. It's not like you're getting a lot more power out of it. If you push on the gas harder, it's not like there's a whole lot more in there. This runs a Porsche 1600 badge on the back. It actually has the 1600 motor in this, which means it's uh, less than 100 horsepower. It's about 80 horsepower in this chassis. Four-speed manual, no power steering, no power brakes. This is a car where you have to pay attention, just like the Daytona. Unlike the Daytona, though, this is a momentum car. This is a car where you actually have to build up speed, and then the challenge is to hang on to it. And because it has that motor all the way out the back, it will pendulum. So initially, Erwin Comenda designed this car. In July of 1947, he conceived this. They refined this car with the thought of racing in mind. And I know the Volkswagen Beetle has raced, but not like the 356. This car has racing provenance and a different chassis, and that is what separates the 356 from the Beetle. This vintage Speedster or an actual 356 Speedster, they're not fast. They are incredibly bare bones. In fact, this makes a Miata look like a spaceship. Not a fast car. Frankly, not a car you really want to drive all that fast. It's not the point. The point is, I have no top on this. In fact, I barely have a windshield. I'm just here enjoying the fact that the ocean's right there. But what I need to talk to you most about is the handling on this car. When you turn through a corner, you have to wait a minute. It is not instantaneous. The suspension has to kind of creak into place and think a minute, and then it flexes, and then it goes around the corner. This being the precursor to Porsche's 911, it has 911 tendencies. That means the engine is after the back axle. It's, it's out there like a pendulum. If you go around a corner too fast, or God forbid, you lift off the throttle in the middle of a corner, you will get lift off oversteer. Now, if you drive one of these cars for a while, you get good with it, you can start to work with that oversteer. You can actually rotate before the corner and then shoot out in a straight line. This has always been the brilliance of that chassis when you get it right. This Speedster takes some finesse. You have to actually be aware of where you are in relation to other cars because they probably can't see you and you weigh about a quarter of what they do. These Speedsters weigh about 1,600 pounds which to give you reference is 800 pounds lighter than the current Miata. 
okay, I need to slow down through these corners because I'm just gonna take it easy. Yeah, wow. And the geometry just kind of makes this car float. So you're not really holding the line through the car on this one. You're just kind of floating. You're, you're just riding it through corners. And it's glorious. This road is glorious. It's just delicate. Because of no engine over the front wheels and no power steering, it has fingertip-like responses. It floats with you. It's, it's not a hardcore refined machine, but that's not the point. What I like about the 356 is it is an accessible classic driving experience. You have all of the history of what Porsche becomes in a old classic roadster that you don't really need to or want to drive fast. Everyday Driver is brought to you by Griot's Garage. Use the code EDRIVER for 10% off your order. are just looking, and they're not here to drive. But that's the great thing about it. There is something for everyone. This is the road you want to be on. It seems like the word replica is a dirty word among car enthusiasts. I think replicas and the proliferation of replicas it's seeing enthusiasts to come be able to do the same experience that you only see on the internet. As awesome as it would be to own the real thing, you would never drive it. You'd never get out here on this road just enjoy. If you've ever looked at a Daytona Coupe and thought, I'd really like to drive that, the closest you're going to get is one of these replicas. But it's not for everybody. It's loud. It is angry. It takes some building up to. You can get online with DriveShare and you can print something else, like that exact 356, and just enjoy that. DriveShare is nationwide, so it doesn't matter if you're on PCH or any favorite road that you've got. You can find a car from somebody that wants to share that experience. But this car, the 356, is available on Haggerty DriveShare through Monterey Touring Vehicles in Monterey. This is one of those incredibly simple and perfect driving experiences because it's not about going fast. You want to look at the scenery, and this car encourages it because it's not that fast. I'm having trouble finding the distinction between the real thing, the real speedster, that is indeed a Porsche, and this. The difference, the dollar amount difference. Can you measure that? This is one of those life experience moments where I can't believe I get to do this. But what I love even more is the fact that you can do this. You can rent this exact car, and if you rent this car, or one like it, or you buy a cheap replica, what's happened is you've gone back in time on the discount aisle. You've made it accessible. You're having this unbelievable experience, and it was affordable. It was possible. If you're on a road like this, we couldn't really drive the sedans or the Econo boxes or other things that we love driving. It had to be a couple of cars that were, I think, among the most raw, visceral experiences you and I have ever had. You're right, but the nice thing is, if you get cars like these that are so involving, then you don't mind going a little slow behind the slow car in front of you because it's, okay. it's so all enveloping, fair it's enough, all around you, and it's, the car is so raw and analog that you kind of don't care you're going slow. All right, I feel obligated to decide here because I got out of the Porsche and I said to you, I understand now why all the collectors go after these cars and they want them and you want to go slow and enjoy the noise. I, okay, I'm right there. I'm there. Of course you are. Of course you are. Paul picked the Porsche. No one's surprised. I like that these replicas actually make it possible for real people to buy them, yes. drive them, rent them. It doesn't yes. matter. That's really cool. I still have to pick the Daytona. In spite of the fact that it's crazy loud, I love the fact that it is so dialed in. The, the inputs here are perfect. I can't believe how good they are. I, I respect the Speedster. I really like the Daytona, but come on, either one on this road is killer. Over Daytona is hands down the most unfiltered driving experience I've ever had. I love it. I cannot believe how good this car drives, how much fun it is, and it's only a replica. This is more my kind of car. 
lightweight, fantastic steering. I'm quite impressed with this. I knew I'd like it, but I didn't know I'd love it. This is the experience I want to be having all the time. And you can do this. This taps into my respect for 911s. And the simplicity makes it much more engaging and organic than driving some big SUV down here, or even some modern sports car. 